Dragons are one of the most well-known and popular of the mythological creatures. But is there more to them than meets the eye? Let's find out in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Cedric, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. I hope that you're doing well. And we are going to continue with our Mythological Creatures Month this week. And we are going to be doing dragons, but me being me, I decided that it might be interesting to have a look at a different type of dragon. Because let's be honest, if I try to do an entire episode just on all the different types of dragons, it would probably be about three weeks long. So instead, I decided that I would focus on one particular type of dragon and we would explore these through two stories involving that type of dragon. Because let's be honest, when you do think of dragons, you might think of graceful Chinese dragons or treasure hoarding lizards like Tolkien's Smaug. I have no idea if you pronounce that as Smaug or Smog or how you pronounce it, but we all know who I mean. Now, Jacqueline Simpson and Steve Rowd note that within the church, dragons always represented evil. And this is probably because of their links with serpents. And we all know why serpents are associated with evil in the Christian church. But in the secular world, they stood for ferocity in battle, which explains why they're really popular on family crests. And they also mark the boundaries of the city of London. So if you've ever been walking along Fleet Street, for example, and you walk past those really large statues of the silver dragon sort of in the middle of the road that's to mark the beginning of the square mile. Now many cultures around the world do have their own dragon stories they are quite a common mythological creature in that regard but as I say you do get regionally specific varieties and that's what we're going to have a look at here and we're going to specifically look at the worm in places like the northeast of England and yes I am biased because that is where I'm from. But they are also quite interesting as well because these do appear in other places as well. So you might find that you have a dragon story near you and you realise it's actually closer to a worm than a dragon. Although worms and dragons are technically the same thing as we're about to get into. So the word worm, and it is spelled as in like earthworm, comes from the Anglo-Saxon word worm, which is spelled W-Y-R-M. And this was a generic word that covered everything from Beowulf's dragon through to scorpions and snakes. And if you are interested in Beowulf and the dragon in that one, there is a blog post that I've linked to from my blog post by the Mr. Hood podcast. But the word worm also came from the Old Norse word orm, which I've probably pronounced wrong. And for a long time, there were essentially synonyms worm and dragon. But over time, of course, worm and dragon have ceased being synonyms and we're more familiar with dragons, while worms are something that you'll find in the garden. Now, there are plenty of dragon stories all over the UK and the northeast of England has at least four stories that I can find, although there's possibly slightly more than that. But we're going to focus on the stories of the Laidley Worm, which is from Northumberland, and the Lampton Worm, which is from County Durham. And there is a reason why I've picked these two specific stories, and that's because... While we do have things like the Sockburn Worm, also in County Durham, it's actually a Wyvern, which is slightly different. And some of the other ones, like the Dragon of Long Witten, also in Northumberland, are actual dragons. So I've deliberately picked the worms in this regard. So we're going to have a look at worms and how they relate to the tradition of English dragon stories. Now we're going to start off with the Lambton Worm. And this story begins with John Lambton, an heir of the Lambton estate. And one Sunday he decides he's not going to go to church. He's going to skip all of that and he's going to go fishing in the River Weir instead. You can probably already realise that this is not going to end well. Now he hooked a creature which the legends describe as being either an eel or a lamprey. And either way it's apparently either thumb sized or three foot long. So it's anywhere between those lengths depending on which story you look at. And John thought he'd caught the devil himself and threw it into a local well, because apparently that's how you dispose of the devil. Now, John forgot about the worm and then eventually left England to go and fight in the Crusades. Now, while he's away fighting and doing whatever he's doing over there, in the meantime, the worm poisons the well. It grows to an enormous size, crawls out of the well and then coils itself around a hill. Now, this is believed to be either Worm Hill or Pensher Hill, depending on, again, which legend you listen to. Livestock began going missing and obviously, as you can imagine, the villagers started panicking at this point. And according to legend, the Lambton worm required the milk of nine cows to keep it happy. 
So there's that magical number nine again. And obviously we did do numbers in folklore a little while ago. Now, most legends say that the worm could wrap itself around the hill seven times. And eventually, after terrorising the locals for a while, the worm got bored and left for Labden Castle. There, the villagers tried to kill it, but no one could overcome the worm because every time they managed to slice into it, it magically healed itself and became whole again. Now, John finally returns from the Crusades and learns about the destruction that's been wrought by the worm in his absence. Now, unlike the other people who've tried to take the worm on, he goes to seek the advice of a local wise woman who teaches him how to defeat it. And part of the advice does require him to kill the first living thing that he sees after he's killed the worm. And this is vital to avoid a curse blighting his family. So the worm abandons its hill and it wraps itself around a rock in the river Weir. John then fixes spearheads to his armour. Other stories say there were knives, others say razor blades, but basically sharp implements. And then he goes down the river to fight the worm. And his father agrees to release John's favourite hound when John wins the battle. And then that way John can kill the first living thing he sees and thus avoid the curse. Now, the worm obviously sees essentially lunch on legs and goes, well, hey, I'm in here, and then tries to wrap itself around John. Trouble was, it actually impales itself on the spearheads and John can then hack the worm to bits and each of the pieces fall in the river which washes them away so the scattered pieces mean that the worm can't reassemble itself like it has done every time before and then this time John has finally won and beaten the worm. John sounds his horn to show that he's won but his father's so overjoyed that he forgets to release the dog and he runs down to see John instead. John realises what's gone wrong but he's unable to kill his father so he kills the dog instead. But the curse kicks in anyway. And according to the wise woman, nine generations of Lamptons wouldn't die in their beds, basically if he didn't do what he was told. And this did prove true for the first three. One of them drowned, and then two died in battle. And the ninth also died in an accident as well. So yes, John did defeat the Lambton worm, but at what cost? Meanwhile, the Laidley worm were going to head north up the coast from County Durham to Northumberland and were off to Spindlestone Heath, which is near the mighty fortress of Barnborough Castle. If you saw the Michael Fassbender version of Macbeth, and it is very, very good, the castle that you see like from the distance, that's Barnborough Castle, essentially. Now, as the legend goes, the king who lived at Barnborough Castle had two children. There was the beautiful Princess Margaret and the brave Child Wind, who's your typical sort of hero of fairy tale type of character. Now, after the death of his wife, the king then sets off in search of a new bride. Meanwhile, Child Wind goes to seek fame and fortune in distant lands, and poor Margaret's left alone in the fortress by herself. After a while, her father returns with his new bride. And the local population turn out because obviously they want to welcome the new queen at this huge, lavish feast. But unfortunately for Margaret, at least, the queen is a witch. And she's immediately jealous of Margaret's beauty and popularity. Shades of the Snow White story there, I think you'll find. Now, the queen curses Margaret to turn into a ladly worm, which is a spell which can only be broken by the return of her brother. Margaret publicly dismisses the threat, thinks it's all nonsense and retires to bed. Sleep doesn't come easily, of course, because she is thinking about this, but eventually she dozes off. Trouble is, in the morning, none of the servants can find Margaret, because instead, her room houses a mighty dragon instead of the princess. The worm actually flees the castle and then takes refuge in nearby caves. So in this regard, it's quite interesting that when faced with humans, the dragon actually chooses to leave instead of fighting anyone. Now, an old ballad did say that she was so venomous that no grass or corn would grow in a seven-mile radius of this cave. The beast needs something to eat and starts plundering livestock, much as the Lambton worm had done in County Durham. The local population ended up consulting a warlock, so again, there's this idea of consulting supernatural help, and he advised them to leave the milk of seven cows in a stone trough. And this daily gift placated the dragon and it stopped stealing their animals. But obviously you can't have a worm in your local neighbourhood and not have the news spread far and wide. So eventually the story of this giant dragon reaches Child Wind and he's furious to hear about Margaret's treatment at the hands of his new stepmother. He immediately sets sail for Bambra and because Child Wind knows all about witches, he's commissioned a ship made out of rowan which will repel her evil magic. Now, in some versions of the story, the Queen calls up a fearsome storm as his ship approaches the coast, and then in others, the Laidly Worm has actually whipped the sea into a frenzy with its tail. But either way, Child Wind just changes course and lands at Budal Bay instead. He runs up the beach and the Laidly Worm rears up behind the cliffs, 
And Childwind obviously must think, hang on a minute, this might not be my best idea. And he is a bit afraid of the dragon, but he does want to save his sister. So he raises his sword and his sister's voice rings out, telling him to put away his blade and to give the dragon three kisses. Now, to his credit, Childwind does obey and lo and behold, the Laidly Worm disappears, replaced by the missing Margaret. Now, the siblings at this point set off for Barnborough Castle, eager to bring the Queen to justice. Now, she realises that Childwind's a little bit annoyed at this point and isn't going to back down, so she starts begging for mercy. And some of the stories say that Margaret was actually quite happy to oblige, but her brother couldn't forgive the Queen's behaviour. So he condemned her to the fate that she'd meted out to his sister. So the Queen vanishes in a puff of smoke, leaving behind a large venomous toad. And the servants chase this beast out of the castle where it goes to hide at the bottom of the castle well. There is another version of the story again where Child Wind touches the Queen with Rowan and then she shrivels up, becomes a toad and flees. So either way, there are local legends that tell of a foul toad haunting the area. And it doesn't really matter which version you look at, all of them end up with the Queen being gone and Margaret being safe. There are again some other versions as well where Child Wind doesn't know that the dragon is his sister but ends up saving her anyway. So what does the worm represent in these particular stories? Now, dragons in folklore usually offer the hero a way to triumph over evil. Now, it is possible that a natural catastrophe befell the Lambton and Laidley areas, and then somehow the family managed to turn the tide in favour of the locals. And then over time, the hero's deeds became his fight with the worm. So he triumphs over the evil of the catastrophe, which then becomes personified as the worm, if that makes sense. But both of these stories do differ in their treatment of the worm. So while they are very specific in using the worm type dragon rather than sort of the ones that you might recognise from paintings and so on, they are slightly different how they approach them. So in the case of the Lambton worm, perhaps the moral of the tale is skipping church on the Sabbath never ends well. And the worm that John catches represents evil because obviously it's a destructive dragon. So they're very much gone with the traditional view of what the, the dragon represents. But it also represents his own engagement with evil, because if he hadn't fished out of the river, who's to say it would ever have grown to the size it did? It may never have bothered anybody. And crucially, John fights the worm after he returns from the Crusades. So it's only as an adult that he's actually equipped to deal with the monster. And he also finally has the experience of battle in order to do so. But it must be said, he only succeeds where others have failed because he seeks the counsel of the wise woman first. So he recognises that he needs a little bit more help and goes looking for it. So if the worm represents evil, she represents wisdom. And she also represents the price of knowledge because she does require a death in exchange for the vital information. And John's unwillingness to pay according to the rules then brings the curse down upon the family. Obviously, there is a curse in the Laidly Worm story as well, but obviously it operates in a very different way because here the Laidly Worm deals with a worm that looks and acts like a monster, but is actually an innocent princess. And that's where I think it's quite interesting that all the stories about the Laidly Worm are about the livestock that are stolen, not people that are killed by it. And the story's true monster becomes her stepmother, the jealous new queen. And in this, the story is also quite similar to the Ballad of Kemp Owen, where a Welsh hero must save a maiden transformed into a monster by her stepmother, and Kempone again must kiss her three times to break the enchantment. So it's very much a localised version of that particular story. And there's also a 14th century tale about the island of Coz, where a physician's daughter is turned into a dragon, and only the kiss of a knight can break the spell. We don't know who the king is. Some historians believe he may have been Ida the Flamethrower, the first English king, and that is one of the best names I think I've come across while doing fabulous folklore. Now, he ruled from 547 to 560 AD, and scholars theorise that the Saxon tales from that time either grew to incorporate the dragon or just essentially copied the Camp Owen story. But either way, the worm's monstrous form is essentially a projection of the queen's evil nature. And that's why Child Wind has to defeat the queen, not the worm. So how do these worms relate to dragons in folklore? It is entirely possible that the English worm descends from the worms of old Norse legends, including Jormungand, the giant serpent that encircles Midgard and does get involved with Ragnarok. Now, these English worms are often connected with water serpents, which in itself is notable, because remember, the Northeast suffered from loads of Viking raids, and the worms could either represent the dragons from their tales or the Vikings themselves. So in battling the dragons, the heroes are essentially battling the invading forces from over the sea. 
In each story, the worm also represents the other. So the Lambden worm is caught while fishing and it doesn't resemble any known creatures. So it's a completely alien creature in its environment. While the Laidly worm is created by a queen from outside of the region. So perhaps the latter story dates to a time of difficulty in the area. So the arrival of a newcomer from elsewhere, coinciding with calamity, might prompt stories of witchcraft. I must admit, I can't help thinking that the Lambton Worm is also something of a cautionary tale because John catches it and then throws it in a well to dispose of it and then promptly forgets about it. So he essentially leaves other people to deal with the mess that he's created. So could this have referred to some kind of threat facing the community that was ultimately left unchecked? The one thing that you find is a common point between them is that both worms also hold their local area to ransom and essentially only providing them with resources can placate them, which again has links back to the pillaging of the Viking raids. So it's this concept of loss of things that you've accrued in order to have safety. Now the Lambton worm must be destroyed to end its reign of terror, while the Laidly worm must simply be transformed. And Simpson and Raoul point out that in the English tales, the heroes don't actually battle the dragons to win treasure or save damsels. John does so to right his mistake, while Child Wind does so to save his sister. Their heroism is very much more of a practical sort, rather than for any kind of financial reward. And interestingly, only one of the stories actually involves a dragon slaying motif, while the other is essentially a dragon rescue, for want of a better word. And as Jamie Tehrani explains, the Lambton Worm is also a redemption story, because John starts the problem when he catches the worm, so he has to kill it to end the story. So he's not a hero hired from elsewhere to solve a local problem, he's basically putting right his own mistake. And this is perhaps the key to these stories after all. Jennifer Westwood and Jacqueline Simpson note that the local legends differ from generic dragon tales because they're so strongly linked to the place where it happened. And this is why you don't get the same focus on treasure or trying to save people in distress. It, they're all, it's all about the local landscape. And as Westwood and Simpson note, and I quote, Almost always it draws attention to some material object which links the amazing events of the tale to the ongoing everyday world. End quote. So even the hero is linked to the area. He's always either part of the ruling family or he's a local worker. And the stories then become fables, praising the ability of the community to deal with a problem without recourse to outside help, because even the warlock and the wise woman, as far as we know, are part of that community. And the stories also embed the story within the local landscape, which helps to create explanations for landmarks or strange features. So in this way, the story literally couldn't happen anywhere else. So if you ever go to Worm Hill, I think it's in Fatfield near Washington, it has marks on the hill which are supposed to be where the worm coiled around the hill. There's also links with Pensher Hill as well. And if you go to Spindlestone Heath, there used to be a, a thing there where it's like, oh, this was where the trough was. So again, there's these elements in the landscape that people have these stories about that are explained by these worm stories. So you do have to wonder, who knows if the worms at one stage were indeed real? Now, what I want to know is what Tales of Dragons do you have in your area? And do you have any of these worm stories? Bearing in mind, obviously, the worms are essentially so named because of the long, elongated kind of style of dragon. So they're not the type that you would see in, say, Harry Potter or something like that. They're kind of much more the serpentine style dragon and there's never any mention of either of them being able to fly but they do have this kind of venomous sort of ravenous side to their nature as well so if you have any of those in your area please do let me know if you have regular dragon stories then obviously let me know about those as well because they're still cool i've just chosen to focus on these ones because as i say the northeast does have these two and the lambton worms the more famous because it does have a ballad associated with it So please do let me know what you think of dragons and what you think of these localised stories as opposed to the big legends of killing dragons. And, you know, the George and the Dragon style story where somebody has to come in from afar to solve a problem. These stories instead choose to have a local boy do it, which I think is quite interesting. So next week we are moving on to unicorns. So that one should be quite interesting. I don't understand the whole current thing about unicorns being on everything and stuff like that. Although I did like the meme where somebody thought that unicorns maybe were just actually like rhinoceroses. And I'm like, yeah, like I can totally go with that because I love rhinos. But yeah, so we're doing unicorns and then we'll have a look at sort of manticores and other wonderful and strange mythological creatures 
for the final week in Mythological Creatures Month. So I hope you enjoyed that. Do remember that I'm doing my talk with the Folklore Podcast Lecture Series on Spiritualism. So if you're interested in mediumship and how the Victorians try to talk to the dead and spirit photographs and, and what Sir Arthur Conan Doyle had to do with all these supernatural shenanigans, then that is basically what I'm going to be covering on September 19th at 8pm. If you can't make it, obviously that's UK time, if you can't make it there is a replay available and you will be able to purchase the recording after the fact as well. It would be lovely to see some of you there. So I hope you enjoyed this episode and I look forward to hearing your dragon stories. Please do feel free to email me, message me on Instagram, Twitter, whatever, however you think is best to get hold of me and it'll be nice to have a bit natter about them. So otherwise, I hope you have a marvellous week ahead and I will see you soon. Cheerio. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you did, feel free to subscribe using whichever podcast app it is that you prefer. If you do use iTunes, if you could leave me a review, that would be fab. Basically, it just means iTunes are more likely to recommend this to other people. And if you're interested in more folklore, please feel free to swing by my blog, which is www.icsedgwick.com, and that's Sedgwick spelled S-E-D-G-W-I-C-K. And you can find all of the links, images, and other bits and pieces that hopefully you enjoy. So have an absolutely fab week ahead, and I'll see you soon. Cheerio!